let me tell you the story of two investors, neither of whom knew each other, but whose paths crossed by one another in an interesting way. Our first investor is Grace Groner. Often at age 12, she was never married, she never had any kids, and she lived all by herself in a one-bedroom house. By all accounts, she was a lovely lady. That made the $7 million that she left to charity when she died at the age of 100 very confusing. Most people who lived around her were confused and asked, where did Grace get all that money from? But there was no secret. There wasn't any inheritance. Grace invested whatever she could from her meager salary and enjoyed the benefit of 80 years of hands-off compounding the stock market. That was it. So guys, today's word of the day is meager. Please let me know what it means in the comment section. A few weeks after Grace died, another unrelated story hit the news. Richard Fuscone, the vice chairman of Merrill Lynch's Latin America division, had declared personal bankruptcy. Fuscone was the exact opposite of Grace Kroner. He was educated in Harvard and then the University of Chicago, and he spent most of his life working as a career banker. He was ready to retire by the age of 40, but... The same year that Grace left a huge fortune to charity, Richard Fuscone found himself pleading bankruptcy before a judge. I guess the purpose of this story is not to tell you to be more like Grace or less like Richard Fuscone. However, it is to highlight that there are no other fields in the world where such stories are even remotely possible. Countless stories in the world of finance teach us that managing money isn't about what you know, it is about how you behave. Unfortunately, that's not how finance is taught or even discussed. The finance industry talks too much about what you need to do to become rich, but they don't talk enough about what you need to do to stop yourself from destroying the good work that you've already done. The Psychology of Money written by Morgan Housel gives you a view into investing that is completely different from the spreadsheet method that Wall Street enjoys following. Today, on Filter Coffee Finance, we're going to dissect this amazing book and delve into seven key takeaways. Let's get right into it. Number one, not all prices come with a label. Let's say you want to buy a new car, the Tesla Model Y. It costs a cool $60,000. How would you go about to pay for this car? I guess you'd have one of three choices. Number one, you could pay $60,000 for the car. Number two, you could buy a second-hand car for less than $60,000. Or number three, you could steal the car. 99% of people would avoid option number three because the consequences of stealing a car, i.e. getting thrown in jail, outweigh the benefits of owning a car. So, in the end, you will pay the price you need to own that beautiful Model Y. Now, let's leave the car dealership and head over to the stock market. You come to this market to buy returns. Let us say that you want to earn a 10% annual return over the next 50 years. Can you earn this return for free? Of course not. Why would the world give you anything for free? Just like the car, there is a price that needs to be paid. In the case of the stock market, the price that you need to pay is volatility and uncertainty. And unlike in the car dealership, the prices in the stock market do not come with a label. Risk and uncertainty are the price of being a part of the stock market. On a side note, if you want to do something low risk right now, that could be subscribing to this channel. I can guarantee that doing that will increase the value of your investments by 10,000% instantly. <coughs> Number two. Fast cars do not get you respect. When you see someone driving a nice car, you rarely think, wow, that guy driving the car is damn cool. Instead, you visualize yourself in that car and you'd imagine, wow, if people saw me driving that car, they would think I'm cool. One of the main reasons that we want wealth is to gain the approval of others. But those other people don't really end up appreciating you, only the things that you own. There is a growing number of people out there who rent private jets for just 10 minutes so that they can take an Instagram selfie. We care about the objects that others own and not the people that own them. Number three, your worldviews are completely shaped by your experiences. If you were born in the 1970s, the stock market went up by 10 times in your teenage years. Whereas if you were born in the 1950s, the exact same stock market went nowhere. Coming of age during the Great Depression or during World War II Europe set you down a path of beliefs, goals and priorities that most people today can't even fathom. In 1959, John F. Kennedy was asked by a reporter what he remembered of the Great Depression. This is what he replied. I have no first-hand knowledge of the Great Depression. My family had one of the great fortunes of the world and it was worth more than ever then. We had bigger houses, more servants, we travelled more. About the only thing I saw directly was when my father hired extra gardeners just to give them a job so that they could eat. I really didn't learn about the depression until I read about it at Harvard. Everyone has experienced a fraction of what's out there but uses those experiences to explain everything they expect to happen. Number four, humans just suck at thinking exponentially. The first hard disk that was developed was called the Model 350 disk file. Does anyone know who it was created by? If you do, comment below. I will pin the right answer. The Model 350 was anything but portable. It needed to be flown around in a private airplane, and after all that work, it could store just a whopping five megabytes of data. Five megabytes of data. 
By the 1970s, the Winchester drive held 70 megabytes, then drives got exponentially smaller with more storage. From 1950 to the 1990s, we gained 296 megabytes in storage. But guess what? In the last 30 years alone, we have gained 20 million megabytes in storage. Much like Moore's law, the principle of compounding is also exponential. There are over 2000 books analyzing how Warren Buffett has made his massive fortune. But none of these books are titled, this guy is rich just because he has been investing consistently over the last 80 years. The most powerful book in finance has not even been written yet. It contains just one page with a long-term chart of economic growth and it is titled Shut Up and Wait. Great investing isn't about earning the highest return. It is about earning pretty good returns that you can stick with for a very, very long period of time. That's when compounding runs wild. Number five. Wealth is what you do not see. When you see somebody driving a $200,000 car, the only real information that you have about their wealth is that they have $200,000 less after buying that car. Humans tend to judge wealth based on what we can see. Since we can't see people's bank accounts or brokerage statements, we tend to judge their wealth based on outward appearances of financial success. Cars, homes, vacations, and Instagram photos. If you're rich, that means you have a high current income. But wealth is something different. Wealth is the money that you have that is not spent. It is the option to do something at a future time. The best way to use your wealth is to use it to control your time, to give yourself options to do what you want to do when you want to do it. Number six, everyone sitting at the table is playing a different game from what you are. The odds of making money in the stock market are 50-50 over one day, 66% over one year, 88% over 10 years and 100% over 20 years. When trading at its peak last year around $360, Tesla's price to earnings ratio was roughly around 150 times. Now, just 8 months later, the exact same company can be bought at a 65% discount for around $127. US In the last 6 months alone, the company has lost over 50% of its market capitalization. If you were a long-term investor looking to buy Tesla stock on April 1st, 2022, $361 was the only price that you could pay. So you would have looked around and said, wow, maybe the people around me know something I don't. And you probably went ahead and bought Tesla, maybe even feeling smart about your decision. However, the short-term traders who were trading Tesla stock at that time did not care about why they bought the stock. They were playing a completely different game from you, the long-term investor. And they were right. For a very long time, the price of Tesla stock kept on going up. But suddenly, they stopped playing their game. And you, the investor, were stuck holding the cards. If you start learning about investing from people who are playing a different game than you, you will always be fooled and eventually lose. Blind imitation is always more dangerous than doing nothing. Number seven, what would you do for a billion dollars? Part of life is about taking risks, but are all risks worth taking? Technically speaking, the odds are always in your favor when you're playing Russian roulette. But think about it, is the downside, i.e. death, worth any possible upside. Real estate prices go up most years, and most years, you'll be collecting a paycheck almost every month. But if you do believe in Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong will eventually go wrong. If the downside risk to investing is complete ruin, then what kind of upside is worth the risk? In the world of investing, leverage is that one thing that can cause ruin. During the global financial crisis, housing prices fell close to 30%. Some companies went bankrupt. In normal competitive markets, something like this should happen. However, the companies that took leverage suffered a double whammy. Not only were they broke, but taking leverage took them out of the game completely. A homeowner wiped out in 2009 had no chance of taking advantage of cheap mortgage rates in 2010. In order to succeed, you must first survive. A key point here is that few things in life are as valuable as options. The option to do what you want, with whom you want, and when you want has an infinite ROI. Before we wrap up with our video, let's go back to where we started, with Grace Groner. Do you think the money that she saved was important to her? I'm guessing it did matter to her, but not necessarily in the materialistic sense. It is obvious that at this point, this 100-year-old woman knew how to live within her means. Even if she wanted to, she wouldn't be able to spend her $7 million fortune. In her will, she said that her fortune should be used to benefit students, fund internships and international study, as well as a possible grant to a student attending pharmacy school. Do you guys know any Grace Kroners in your life? If you do, please share the story with us in the comment section. People like Grace are rare and in our fast-paced modern world are becoming even rarer. The least that we can do is give them the credit that they deserve. If you guys enjoyed this video, consider giving it a like and subscribing to Filter Coffee Finance. It really helps us out and keeps me motivated to create more useful content for all of you all. Cheers guys, keep failing and keep learning. And until we meet again, this is Filter Coffee Finance signing off.